You're listening to the premiere episode of This Side of the Rainbow. I'm your host, Tyler Albertario, queer historian and historical queer. As I'm sure many of you know, these are pretty rough times to be queer, not just in America, but all over the world. Rising state persecution and anti-LGBTQ plus rhetoric have really taken their toll. But even in the face of these daunting challenges, there are still those on the ground eager, willing, and able to make a difference in the fight for queer rights. And that's where we, at this side of the rainbow, come in. Every episode, I'll be speaking with a new guest with specific insights into the struggle for LGBTQ plus rights on the ground in their communities. We'll be speaking with activists, politicians, writers, nonprofit leaders, and many more, all about the latest in LGBTQ plus current affairs, politics, and history from a local perspective. The one thing they'll all have in common, though, is that they're all, in their own unique way, doing the good work and fighting the good fight for queer rights and freedom. So, for listeners who might feel a little bit uneasy about the current state of affairs, this is a space where we're at least going to try to unpack things in an informal yet informative way and also try to have some fun. And wherever possible, we'll let you know what you can do to help as well. So join us as we welcome our first guests and ask them one simple yet loaded question. What exactly is going on? on their side of the rainbow. Now, obviously, we just had here in the U.S. a very high-stakes midterm election in which a lot of analysts, pundits, and commentators were expecting a quote-unquote red wave, unquote, where Republicans were going to supposedly sweep into power with something like 240 House seats and 54, 55 Senate seats, give or take. Democrats, obviously, as many of you are aware, did way better than expected in a lot of key races. Republicans took the House, though, but with a razor-thin majority, and Democrats actually gained a seat in the Senate to take them to a total of 51. The biggest victories for Democrats, though, was, of course, at the state level. They picked up a bunch of key governorships in Arizona, Maryland, and Massachusetts. They picked up the Minnesota State Senate. But, without a doubt, the biggest state-level victory for Democrats, I guess you could sort of call it the crown jewel of this midterm, would have to be Michigan where not only incumbent Governor Gretchen Whitmer was reelected by double digits, but also Michigan Democrats, they basically defied all expectations. They seized control of the Michigan State Senate and House of Representatives, giving Democrats a state government trifecta for the first time in 40 years since 1983. Now, this victory in particular has a lot of potential to sort of upend a lot of how Michigan has operated for several decades now, in particular as it pertains to LGBTQ plus rights and policy, which we'll be getting into. And to discuss all of this and more, I have the distinct honor and privilege of introducing my guest today, the inaugural guest in the history of this side of the rainbow. Ladies, gentlemen, and MBs, I present to you the incoming Speaker Pro Temp of the Michigan House of Representatives, member of the Michigan Legislative LGBTQ Plus Caucus. Please welcome Lori Pohatsky. Lori, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Tyler. I'm, I'm so excited and I'm honored to be the, the first guest to kick this off. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I guess my first question uh, to you, Lori, is uh, given all the sort of economic and historical headwinds Democrats were facing, why do you think uh, Democrats in general had such a comparatively good midterm? And why did specifically Michigan Democrats do as well as they did? Yeah, I think that writ large across the country, Republicans kind of lost the plot. They went really hard into the extremist side of their their party. 
uh, you know, obviously, as it relates to reproductive health, you know, with the, the Dobbs decision, that was going to be a really huge issue. And I think that they did themselves no favors by leaning into, you know, a lot of these no exception policies, which were unpopular enough as it was, you know, much less after a lot of the the horror stories that we saw come to pass after Dobbs. And then obviously, you know, as it relates to LGBTQ plus rights and protections, you know, the whole groomer narrative and, you know, book bans and things like that were just wildly unpopular. And so much of what we saw coming from the Republicans across the country really dug into that. Here in Michigan, you know, the same goes, but we also had uh, some ballot initiatives that were on the ballot, some constitutional amendments that really drove people out. One of them being Prop 3, which enshrined in the Constitution the right to make your own reproductive health decisions, obviously as it relates to abortion, but also contraception, uh, pre and postnatal care, things like that. So it really drove people out to the polls and they recognized that the Republican Party was just not in their camp on one of their most animating issues. So I, I think that that uh, really, really helped us. But I mean, we also ran campaigns about things that mattered to people. And meanwhile, Republicans were out trying to, you know, ban books and, you know, ban uh, medically appropriate treatment for for transgender kids and, you know, get, being obsessed with uh transgender kids in sports and things like that. So I just think that they really did themselves no favors. And meanwhile, we had really comp compelling campaigns, as well as issues that were on the ballot that worked in our favor. So if you if you had to sort of peg a percentage to each individual factor, what percentage of this victory do you think would be owed to the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs and Proposal 3, which sort of came after, and what percentage do you think is owed to the backlash that you described against people like Tudor Dixon, the Republican nominee for Michigan governor, and all these sort of psycho-conservative parent groups running around the country and around the state of Michigan screaming, screaming about groomers and top surgeries and drag queen story hour and, you know, Im imaginary litter boxes in elementary school classrooms? You know, my knee jerk reaction is to say that the majority was in response to the Dobbs decision uh, and slightly less than majority was these, you know, like you said, just fantastical narratives around groomers and, and uh, gender affirming, affirming surgeries and things like that. But it's hard to say because those two things became so inextricably linked that it was nearly impossible, at least here in Michigan, to tease them apart. You know, there there started being these rumors and theories and allegations that Prop 3 was going to not only impact the parental consent law here in Michigan around reproductive health and, yes, you know, all, all medical uh, decisions, including gender affirming care, uh, was going to remove parental consent, which one it wasn't. But they also took it a step further and tried to allege that it would make it illegal for parents to have any say in those matters, which is obviously not true and makes no sense. But the the one became so linked with the other that it's frankly hard to say, you know, which which had more to do with electoral victories because again, Republicans really lost the plot and they, they had such a hard time just separating their various, you know, once again, fantastical conspiracy theories about what these various things were going to do. Um, so my, my, my gut tells me that, you know, Dobbs and reproductive uh, health and, and reproductive justice issues had slightly more to do with it than anti-LGBTQ, uh, you know, bigoted attacks. But again, those things became one in the same after a certain point. So it's really hard to tease them apart here in Michigan. So... The state legislative session is about to kick off. I think it starts, uh, what, January 11th, right? Yes, correct. Right. So we're recording this December 20th. So, you know, who knows? By the time this episode is fully edited and posted, the session might have already started. Um, so you, of course, though, are now going to be part of this brand new Democratic State House leadership team. 
Uh, what's going through everyone's mind right now? Like, what are the priorities for everybody uh, in the Demo- in the Michigan Democratic Party as this really critical session uh, is really coming up in just a couple of weeks? <laughs> There's a list. There's certainly a list. Uh, and it ranges from everything to, you know, repealing right to work, which is something that uh, Republican governor you know, pushed through after swearing up and down he wasn't going to do it and has had really negative impacts here in Michigan to repealing the 1931 criminal abortion ban that is still in the books. Obviously, Prop 3 negated that, but it's still there's obviously still good reason and, and frankly, wisdom in repealing it off the books anyway. And the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act. So our uh, civil rights statute here in Michigan uh, does not provide pr- explicit protections for the LGBTQ community. There has been an interpretive statement that the Department of Civil Rights has been acting under, and I think we're probably going to talk about the Roush World decision that the Michigan Supreme Court uh, issued earlier this year. But again, codifying it in uh, our state statute has a lot of value and is something that is certainly a priority for our caucus uh, in this coming term. And you mentioned that decision by the Michigan Supreme Court. Uh, for, For the listeners, who may not be aware, there's, this has been a years-long battle in the state of Michigan. In, I believe it was 2018, the State Commission on Human Rights issued this sort of advisory opinion that the state anti-discrimination law, by virtue of covering sex, also covered anti-sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination. And that obviously is a view that was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Bostock v. Clayton County. It was also validated by this decision by the Michigan Supreme Court that was just issued this past July. But still, that being said, there's always the possibility that these decisions are sort of fleeting, that, you know, judicial precedent, especially in these days, are are not set in stone the way they used to be, and that the onus really is going to be on the states and the state legislatures to make sure that these sort of rights are protected. And that's not just for LGBTQ plus rights, but also in terms of repealing that 1931 reproductive health law that proposal three was intended to sort of supersede. And so how much of a priority is it going to be for Michigan Democrats to sort of codify this stuff in the somewhat limited time you have in a state legislative session? It's it's extremely important. You know, as, as you mentioned, court cases or Supreme Court cases, as we have seen recently, can be overturned. So I don't want any of us to just assume that, you know, this decision came down, we're good, we're safe, we're protected we need to be doing a a belt and suspenders approach to all of this and making sure that we provide as many protections as we can in all of the ways that we can. So, you know, repealing uh, the 1931 law is incredibly important. Uh, Codifying the Roush World decision uh, in the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act is incredibly important. There are just things that we need to do uh, to make sure that as you know, the political winds change, folks have the protections that they have made very, very clear uh, are necessary, are important to them, are priorities. And frankly, we've made clear our priorities for us too. Most of us ran on uh, expanding the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, even after the Roush World decision. It was still something that we knew was very, very important. Uh, Most of us ran on repealing that 1931 law with full knowledge that Prop 3 was on the ballot and was, you know, fingers crossed, likely to pass. So it, it's incredibly important that we still codify all of these. And, you know, I think that this election, you, you mentioned that it was unlikely that Democrats were going to do well, much less as well as we did here in Michigan. I think that is absolutely fair to say. So I think the fact that we did as well as we did is a mandate from voters, and it is up to us to live up to that mandate and do what they sent us to do. Now, you also kind of have a really, really slim majority in the Michigan House. It's I think it's something like 56 to 54 at last count. So is is, is everyone sort is is everyone sort of on board with this in the Democratic caucus? Uh, are you are you guys you know, you're going to be on the leadership team team. Are you going to need to sort of uh, crack any heads <laughs> in terms of to uh, to whip to whip the votes on, on any of this? Or is everyone sort of on the same page? 
As far as I know, we haven't had any conversations with anyone where anyone seems not on the same page. I, I think everyone understands that this is what we came here to do. Uh, but that being said, you know, like you said, the 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 margin is what it is. Uh, the priorities are what they are. We will do what we have to do to make sure we can deliver for the people who sent us here to get this work done. Yeah, no, no margin for error as well. Um, now, in terms of now, we we're talking about sort of codifying existing precedent and repealing old laws but we're but you know there's also sort of this proactive policy that still needs to be done namely on the subject of uh banning conversion therapy which has been the trend in democratic controlled states all throughout the country is that going to be a priority for michigan democrats in this legislative session in addition to everything else that we've mentioned it absolutely is. It's legislation that we have introduced before. Uh, the governor took executive action, at, you know, to to ban it as best as she could, uh, as it relates to state agencies and state departments uh, practicing it. So, you know, that was a, a really helpful step. But again, the legislature needs to step in and uh, ban the practice entirely and reintroduce that bill, get it across the finish line. It is absolutely something that we have discussed, and it is absolutely a priority. So, yes. Now. When you when you guys do eventually get to that, I can only imagine the group of, you know, it's part of my French, but the absolute fucking freaks that Michigan Republicans are going to trot out in any kind of public hearings about banning conversion therapy. Is there anyone you know of if, locally in the state of Michigan that we should be keeping an eye out? I'm sure they're going to trot out people, you know, freaks like Matt Walsh and such. But is there anybody locally that sort of you're keeping an eye on as this type of legislation in particular winds its way through both houses of the legislature? Yeah, you know, I don't know if the the news made its way out to you, although you are on top of things, which is part of why I adore you so much. So you may very well be aware, but I'm not sure how many listeners are aware. A couple months back, uh, there's a community in uh, Michigan called Dearborn, and they had a huge event about book banning, and it, it just got overtly uh, anti-LGBTQ. And there were, you know, some of the, here they're called Moms for Liberty, I believe, um, which started out as a anti-masking and then anti-vaxxer movement uh, and has morphed into uh a book banning coalition as well. So, and, and I believe actually uh, some of them got elected this term. So I am sure that they will have people who want to testify uh, on, on a policy like that. But what's important to note and something that we've had to deal with in the minority is the majority gets to decide who comes to testify. That's not to say that people won't show up and attempt to, uh, but there were absolutely times where we had people who, frankly, were, were experts in the field that was being discussed at committee hearings who were not allowed to. Or, you know, I, I think back to uh, COVID-19 uh, mitigation policies that were put in place. And we had people who came to talk about how it was a positive impact on them and it, it you know, kept them safe. And, and they were grateful that these mitigation strategies were put in place and they were not allowed to testify. It was only, you know, the, the folks who wanted to talk about how it was detrimental to their business, which is a valid thing to hear about, obviously, but it was very clearly one-sided. I am certainly not advocating for that. I think that there is actually value in debate and hearing multiple sides of, of any given issue. That is, frankly, what we are put here as legislators to do. However, that does not mean giving a platform to hatred and bigotry and lies and things that are going to be harmful for the community, particularly the youngest among us. So I, I, I can see a world where these folks either try to come in themselves or certainly try to give talking points uh, to allied members of the legislature during these committee hearings. But I do really find comfort and uh, hope in the fact that we have the ability to shut that down now. And I, I'm not talking about shutting down debate. Again, debate is crucial for, for the work that we do in the Capitol. But that does not mean giving dangerous lies that are meant to incite fear and panic and hatred 
a platform. And I am grateful that we don't have to do that this term because we certainly have had to tolerate it uh, in my first two terms, certainly this last one. And I was literally about to ask sort of how heavy a gavel are you guys planning on wielding in regards to this? Because they're obviously going to be abusing any type of privileges that are granted to them. And, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, it, it would be sort of a bad look, I guess you could say, to be seen to be shutting down debate, quote unquote. But I think you do need to sort of strike that right balance in terms of wielding a heavy gavel when it's needed. So what sort of scenario would you envision would bring some sort of move like that by you guys who are now in the majority? Yeah, you know, I, again, I think that debate is healthy, and that is encouraged. But debate also assumes that everyone is coming from a place of of good faith and are arguing, you know, with facts and things that can be backed up. They're not just spewing, pardon my language, but bullshit for the sake of harming a community. And I think that that is the, the line that we need to start towing. And, and I, I understand that sometimes people have a difference of opinion about facts and, and, you know, where that line is might be difficult for us to ascertain, but there are not fucking litter boxes in schools. I, you know, I am not going to tolerate my colleagues or my community being called groomers or pedophiles or any other of, of the nonsense that we've had to deal with. Um, and I, I think that that's, we, we need to come from a place of protecting the people who are frankly the most, most vulnerable right now. And there are a number of communities that we've seen increases in attacks against, you know, obviously the, the black community, the, the Jewish community and the LGBTQ community. And I think that we need to do everything we can to protect the folks who are being attacked the most right now. And I think that that's where it's going to come in handy and be very, very crucial uh, that we not allow those unfounded and baseless and frankly just disgusting attacks to take place. Hey guys, this is Tyler. Really hope you're all enjoying my conversation with Lori Pohutsky, the new Speaker Pro Temp of the Michigan House of Representatives. Just jumping in to let you all know, you can support this side of the rainbow on Patreon at patreon.com slash TSOTRpod. You can also follow us on Twitter at TSOTRpod for all the latest info on upcoming guests and episodes. Now back to my discussion with Lori. Now, I just saw you were in D.C. last week to witness President Biden sign the long overdue Respect for Marriage Act. So... What was that experience like for you and the people who were there to share that experience with you? It was amazing. I, I mean, you know, I, you've done a really great job on social media of talking about the, the pros and the cons of the Respect for Marriage Act and frankly, just what is feasible at this level with what we have right now. So that being said, I think it's really important that we celebrate the wins when we get them. And this was certainly a win. Like you said, it was long overdue. Uh, it was really wonderful to be there with the people I was with who have been in this fight for a really long time, who have been doing it much longer than I have in any meaningful way. You know, I was there with uh, Representative John Hoadley, who was uh, one of, at the point that I was there with him, three out members in the House, four total in the legislature. Um who frankly paved the way for a lot of the work that I've been able to do. And it was amazing to be there with him. I was there with my niece, which was incredible. I just, there's so much of the work that I do is inspired by her and is trying to make the world a better place uh, than the one I grew up in with, you know, varying levels of success for her. Uh, so it was wonderful. It, it was great to be able to go around DC and see people who were all happy about the same thing. That was wonderful. But that being said, there are gaps within the Respect for Marriage Act. So it was also kind of uh, a way of better grasping the marching orders that we have back in Michigan. And, and there are things that we need to take care of. And it was kind of a, a call to action as much as it was a celebration. And let's sort of get into that. By the way, thank you for sharing. That was that was wonderful. But yeah, let's get into that. So you mentioned the gaps in the Respect for Marriage Act. You know, obviously, there's been a lot of discourse about it, as you alluded to. Um, I've 
sort of done my best to sort of educate people as to its significance and what it does and doesn't do. What it does is repeal the 1996 Federal Defense of Marriage Act, which had already been overturned by the United States Supreme Court, not in Obergefell v. Hodges, but in United States v. Windsor, the case that Edie Windsor brought because she didn't want to be paying extra estate taxes on her deceased spouse, Thea Spears' estate. But what it also does is removes the provision that had been part of the Defense of Marriage Act, which states that states may refuse to recognize same-sex marriages performed in other states and other U.S. jurisdictions. And that's really sort of the key thing in case Obergefell v. Hodges is ever overturned, because that was the case which overturned that provision of, of the Defense of Marriage Act. And, you know, going back sort of to what the legislature can do in Michigan, in 2004, obviously, the Republicans' anti-gay crusade that particular election cycle also affected Michigan because voters there passed Proposal 042, which banned same-sex marriages and civil unions in the state, and was later interpreted by the Michigan Supreme Court in 2008 to also prohibit domestic partnership benefits. And Michigan was one of the, I think it was 13 states whose state constitutional amendments were directly overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court in Obergefell. And, but despite the protections afforded by the Respect for Marriage Act, this still doesn't change the fact that Proposal 042 is still, I guess you could say it's technically still a part of the Michigan state constitution. And it would be uh, instantly reactivated if the court were to ever overturn Obergefell, which Justice Thomas has been advocating, especially in his concurrence in the Dobbs case. And however, Michigan's in sort of a unique position, because unlike those other 12 states affected by Obergefell, Michigan's the only one that's about to be controlled by a Democratic legislature. So all that being said, in, in, the, in that long-winded explanation, I guess the, the next question I, I'm going to put to you is, what actually can you guys in the legislature do to try and try to the best of your ability sort of undermine and hopefully eventually repeal proposal 042 before it's possibly too late i am a big proponent of uh being almost painfully honest with folks and the fact of the matter is we can repeal the statutory provision that bans same-sex marriage uh but we cannot just repeal the constitutional amendment that would have to go back before the voters because it was a voter initiated amendment so the only thing that we would be able to do potentially, is to pass legislation to put it on the ballot. That would require a two-thirds majority in each chamber, both the House and the Senate. And I have been very honest with folks that I'm not sure we could get that. So I have had some very, very, very preliminary discussions with folks about is there value in trying to put it up for a vote and even potentially letting it fail as an activating measure? Uh, but I mean, if that is what happens, then it fails. It means it will not be on the ballot, which means that we need a citizen led initiative, much like we had with, uh, proposal two and three, uh, this cycle. And it's worth noting that those are very, very expensive. They're very, very onerous. They're very, very difficult. So that, that is just a, a, brutally honest lay of the land. That is not to say that any of those things isn't possible or not worth doing. Uh, but that's just a, a factual assessment of what is possible for us to do and what is not. We cannot repeal that constitutional amendment without it going to the ballot uh, first. And getting it there is much easier said than done. So for, for a voter-initiated amendment, how many signatures would need to be collected and what are some sort of the sort of quirky Michigan specific requirements that would be needed to be fulfilled if that were to be attempted? 
So it's based off the last election. And one thing that uh, we are encountering is our turnout keeps getting higher, which is a great problem to have. But that also means that the required signatures keep getting higher and higher. It's a higher bar each time. So for instance, uh, this cycle, it was nearly 500,000 that were required. Uh, and because turnout was so high, it has gotten even higher. So it was probably much closer to 500,000. I don't have a exact um, number for you, but it was discussed. You know, I, I have a lot of uh, friends that were involved with Prop 3 and the night of the election, they were half joking, but not really, <laughs> that they keep making it more difficult for themselves because every time they do a citizen-led initiative, the number of required signatures keeps getting up, uh, keeps getting higher, I'm sorry. So uh, since turnout was higher with this election, it is much closer to 500,000 required um, without being able to give the exact amount. Now, in 2020, if I remember correctly, there was a similar citizen-led initiative to, in effect, sort of codify the Michigan Commission on Human Rights' decision in regards to the state civil rights law for sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, that was not successful, I take it? Correct. They did not have enough signatures. How short were they? Do, do, you, happen to, do you happen to recall? I'm not even sure it got to that point because it was so, uh, I, I cannot remember. I know that there was a lot of back and forth and uh, it got a little messy in all honesty. It, it just was not, it, it started looking a little desperate if I'm being perfectly honest, not to, you know, speak down, speak poorly of anyone's work on it, but um, there were a number of, of issues with that. So it, it was uh, profoundly unsuccessful. So sort of moving on from that, that sort of seems like a tall order, right? So that would be in the eventuality that Obergefell v. Hodges is actually overturned by the Supreme Court. And another case that, you know, I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't bring this up, even though I don't think it's as immediate an issue as Obergefell for reasons I'm about, I'm about to lay out here, but... People also people are also very obviously concerned in the wake of the Dobbs decision about, you know, Lawrence v. Texas, the 2003 Supreme Court ruling that overturned sodomy laws across all U.S. states. Now, I personally don't think that, you know, say Kavanaugh, for instance, I don't think he I don't think he really has the stones to, for lack of a better term, to be sort of the deciding vote on that the way he was in Dobbs because it's it's not as integral to the conservative agenda at least as it's at least as it presently stands right so um but i but you know people are still very concerned about this now Michigan also one of the i think in Lawrence it was 14 states that had their sodomy laws directly overturned by the Supreme Court in Lawrence now, that, I understand, is a statutory provision, which the legislature can very easily overturn, correct? Correct. Are there, are there plans to? I believe so, yes. I mean, it, it had come up, uh, you know, previously before trying to introduce it, um, and it was put on hold because, like you said, it, it's not as, um, I don't want to say pressing, but it just didn't seem as, as timely of an issue. Uh, but I think that it's still worth trying to address it while we can. Um, and yes, I, I do believe that that will more likely than not be repealed. Because like you said, it is statutory. Um, it, it's essentially low hanging fruit. I mean, not really, because it's still going to be a whole, you know, rigmarole that we have to deal with from the other side. But it's it's easy for us to repeal with a simple majority. So, yes, I, I think that we can expect to deal with that this term. Do you think you guys will enjoy any kind of Republican support on that? I don't know. It's hard to say. You know, I know for a fact that we have some Republicans who support Elliot Larson. Um, we've not talked about same-sex marriage. I don't think we have two-thirds majority, but there are some that I think are supportive of it. I wonder if repealing the sodomy law would be too close to, um, you know, wading into some of these more extremist areas that people don't want to get involved in. 
it's it's hard for me to say just because those are not the conversations we've had with some of the folks on the other side of the aisle. So I don't I really don't know. It's hard to say. Well, I guess we'll see, right? So now to sort of close on a lighter note, I guess we can say. This legislative session in Michigan will also mark a very important milestone in not only Michigan's LGBTQ history, but U.S. LGBTQ history. October 15th, 2023 will, of course, mark the 50th anniversary of former Ann Arbor City Council members Nancy Wexler and Jerry DeGreek becoming the first openly LGBTQ plus elected officials in the history of the United States, not just in Michigan, but the entire United States, when they both came out simultaneously in a session of the Ann Arbor City Council in protest of the city attorney's inaction over illegal anti-lesbian discrimination at a local bar. It's one of the more overlooked coming out events, in my opinion, primarily, I think, because if if any of you listeners know your 70s history, well, you'll, you'll notice it's kind of directly sandwiched in between events like the Yom, Kipp- Yom Kippur War, the gas embargo, and some major developments in the Watergate scandal like the Saturday Night Massacre. So it really sort of got overlooked even at the time, even though it was a very watershed event. And But I've kind of had the, the really distinct honor and privilege over the years of having the chance to speak with both Nancy and Jerry about their experiences with this. And they're both like really, truly incredible people. And you know, that being said, I'd, I'd be remiss if I forgot to ask you, do you think there should be some sort of commemoration by the legislature to mark the 50th anniversary of this event? And what sort of commemoration do you think there should be? I do. I would be lying if I said that we had already discussed it. We haven't. And I think a lot of that is just because, frankly, there is a whole new world of possibilities for us right now. It was a fight, a truly just a nasty, silly fight to even get a resolution honoring Pride Month in the state of Michigan. And in fact, we were not able to get it uh, this year. We got it in 2021 and we're not able to get Pride Month in 2022. So when we talk about what we are able to do and the, the honors that we are able and the respects that we are able to give to people, uh, from the LGBTQ community here in Michigan that deserve it. it. It's it's a little overwhelming and slightly emotional to me that we are in a position where we can thank people like Nancy and Jerry for doing things that made it easier for people like John Holdley and Jeremy Moss and myself and all of the incoming members of the, the new soon-to-be LGBTQ caucus uh, to do what we do. And so yes, all of that is to say, I, I appreciate you talking about it and raising awareness about it. And yes, I do think that there is something that we should be doing. I have thoughts. Again, like I said, we haven't had these conversations, but you know, we can do legislative tributes. We can do uh, you know, recognition on the, the House or Senate floor or both for them. And it's just a little overwhelming to me that we are even in a position where we can do that when, you know, literally six months ago, we couldn't even talk about pride in the Capitol. Um, And we have people like Nancy and Jerry to thank for the fact that that is going to change this term. Because if they had not done what they did 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago now, we wouldn't be in a position to do what we are doing and make the strides that we are making. So Yes, I do think that we will be honoring them. We absolutely should be honoring them. And I'm, I'm frankly just talking about it. You know, I mean, we we kind of had a, a rough outline of what you and I were going to discuss tonight, but actually talking about it with you is so emotional and overwhelming because we have been gagged from doing it up until this point. Uh, you know, I mean, if you look at some of the speeches it, in the House, you you can't just give speeches. It has to be on something. And obviously, we were never allowed to speak on Pride Month or anything like that, or any LGBTQ rights legislation, because it never came before the House. But in the Senate, you do have the ability to give remarks. And Senator Moss would have to dress up a a speech about Pride, you know, and, and kind of poke fun, because they wouldn't pass a Pride resolution, but they would pass a 
a beer month, a craft beer month resolution. So he would, you know, give these speeches where he was actually talking about pride, but dressing it up as though he was talking about how proud he was of, you know, the craft beer industry in Michigan. And the fact that we have had to do that and we we won't this next term is just kind of astounding to me. And it's a, a really emotional thing to actually be able to talk about and to to celebrate things like that. Uh in, in the place that we work and in, in, in the people's house. It, it's just, it's incredible. It truly is incredible. And just for the benefit of our listeners, both in Michigan and around the country and elsewhere, is there anything that they can do in terms of helping along these sets of priorities in the legislature as we move forward? Absolutely. I mean, amplifying the good work that we do once we're able to do it, because like you said, the the legislative term hasn't started yet. Uh, But amplifying that is really, really helpful so that people remember and recognize why they elected us. I I think that, you know, two years is both an incredibly short amount of time and a very, very long time when you're hoping that people remember things by the time it's, you know, election time again. So amplifying that is really, really helpful. Uh, you know, no one wants to talk about elections considering we just came off of one. Uh, but when that time rolls around again, helping in any way you can. I mean, we have a slim majority that we are hoping to to build on and we're going to work as hard as we can to build on it. But, you know, whether you're in Michigan or not, you know, donating your energy, your time, if you have any money, obviously money to candidates is always helpful. But, you know, that those those one on one conversations that we have with people and the ability for us to tell people and show them this is what we did. You sent us here to do these things and and we did it. Um, That's always really, really helpful. And that's part of why we were able to do what we did with flipping the House and the Senate here. And it is how we are going to build on that majority uh, in 2024 with the House and then 2028 with the House and Senate again. Lori Pohutsky, incoming Speaker Pro Temp of the Michigan House of Representatives. Thank you so much for joining me on this inaugural episode of This Side of the Rainbow. Thank you for having me, Tyler. It was wonderful. I really appreciate the the time. You've been listening to the premiere episode of This Side of the Rainbow. Be sure to support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash tsotrpod, and also follow us on Twitter at tsotrpod for all the latest on upcoming episodes and where you can find us. If you want to follow my own personal Twitter, you can do that too. I'll be putting my own personal handle and everything else in the description for this episode. A couple of acknowledgments. Thanks so much to Kevin Segu for creating the show's logo, and to Augusto Denise for composing the show's theme song. You can find both of them on Fiverr, and I'll be putting their handles in the episode description as well. And thanks again so much to Lori Pohutsky for taking the time to join me as our first ever guest. Wishing her and Michigan Democrats all the best of luck with everything we discussed. I'm your host, Tyler Albertario, and thanks so much for joining us on this side of the rainbow.